Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about one of the uh, common uh, forces in statics and dynamics and in most of engineering applications, and that is rope, the tension in the rope or a belt. And one of the common things that I always see my students say is uh, the tension in the rope is constant throughout the rope regardless. Well, that's not true. There are some conditions that need to be satisfied and there are some situations in which this constant tension in the rope assumption can be uh, considered or used. So uh, we have to consider whether these conditions are valid in our application before we can use it. So two major conditions are needed in a straight rope, right, that does not go around anything like a pulley, for the tension to be what? To be constant, right? So if I have, let's say, a block here, with mass m and it is being dragged on the uh, floor with a rope here and on this side of this horizontal rope i'm applying force f right so now if you draw the free body diagram of this block then you would tell me that I have the mg force, I have the n normal force, and I have the tension in the rope. And the question is whether this guy is equal to the force F that is applied on the other side. And most of the time my students regardless say yes, T and F, so the T that is applied here on this side, it is the same as what? F. And it could be correct if these two conditions are satisfied. One, the condition number one is the mass of the rope must be negligible. If the mass of the rope is not negligible, the assumption of constant tension is absolutely not correct. Okay, so let's say here we assume that this rope has a mass, right? So let's say the length of it is L and the mass of it is M sub R. Correct, so we can say the mass density of it, mu, is equal to mr over L. Okay, again, this is the mass density or the mass per length. Correct. So now, if I um, look at this rope entirely, if I look at the whole rope, and draw the free body diagram for the whole rope, correct? On this side, I have F, and on this side, I have what? T, and if there is a mass, then of course, I have what? I will have a um, mg term here, like mr times g, Correct, and let's say I'm using X and Y as traditional X and Y. So, um, now, if the problem is static, if the problem is static case, which means this object does not move and the rope does not move, then in the X direction, what I can write for the rope is... So if I look at the X direction, I say some of the forces in the X direction for this rope is F minus T is equal to mass of it times acceleration of it, right? X double dot of R. And now, again, if the problem is a static, this X double dot of R is what? Zero, so it means F equals to T, or if this mass is what? Negligible, correct? So, again, I write it for you. If 
the rope doesn't move which is x double dot of r equals zero it's the if it's, it's the static problem then yes t equals f if the rope's mass is negligible that means this term zero still the product zero right that means again t equals what f if it's not the case in general then t is equal to f minus mr times x double dot of r okay so the portion of the force a portion of it is used to accelerate the rope itself and that means t is going to be less than f correct because this term is positive if it moves to the right okay so you're going to lose some tension some of the force that you use to tow the block during uh, the motion and allowing the rope because it is used to accelerate the rope itself and you can show that uh, this change from f to t is going to happen linearly so if this uh, magnitude here is f and this magnitude here is t the way that the tension along the rope is changing is a linear relation right because in general if you consider only this much of the rope right so if you consider some variable from uh, right side of the rope to the left side and call the length of that portion u right or you might call it whatever else that you want let me just use another variable z then the mass of this portion is going to be what the mass of this portion is going to be the length of it z times mu which is the mass density so if the tension here on the left side of this section you call it t at location z then you can say that f minus t at location z is mass of that portion which is z times mu times acceleration of that um, portion really correct x double dot of that block correct and here what you can see is if this acceleration is constant which it is right it's a constant number whatever it is you might call it just a then from here you can see that t at location z is going to be f minus what a times mu times z correct so you see a times mu is just a constant number mu is constant a is constant if the rope is uniform then clearly you see by increasing z from right to left this term is going to increase so the whole term linearly decreases Okay, so the tension linearly drops along the rope when the rope mass cannot be neglected. A second condition that we need for the tension in the rope to be considered constant is there is no knot or knots along the rope. So no knots. The rope should not be tied together or create a knot, a loop around it. Otherwise, at that point, you cannot consider the tension of the rope to be constant. So if you have this rope and you have a knot like this, what's going to happen? Well, when there is a knot, the... Uh, fibers in the um, rope are going to be bent so if you look at here at this cross section you do have the tension as well as bending and you know when you bend the material right 
So if you consider that top part that it was like this, and now it is bent like this. So when something is bent, as you know from solid mechanics, there is the uh, neutral axis here that is passing through the center of area of the object. And then depending on the direction of the bending, one side of the neutral axis will be under tension. The other side will be under compression. So here, this part, the way it is bent, this part that I'm hatching in black, this part is under compression. And this part here that I hatch with green, let me use backward direction. So this side here that I'm hatching in green, this part is under tension. And so if it was already under tension because we were uh, pulling it, right, with this force F and F, let's say. So now at this top point, right, what you will have is at this point, you're going to have two tensions. One that is basically F divided by cross section, the tensile force, and the other one is due to bending, which as you know from solid mechanics looks like MY divided by I, and at that, that point is I max really, is Y max divided by I max. Correct, and in this point, the tension and the compression, since they have different signs, they're going to be subtracted. So uh, now it's not as simple as that. And the reason is at this point here, you have friction. And when you have this friction, this friction opposes a little bit of that force. So actually in this area, the tensile force, the force per cross section is not going to be F. It's going to be actually less than F. So uh, whether this combination is going to be bigger than the original F over A or not, that's a separate story. So here I would rather call it F prime and F prime is the um, tensile force right in this loop inside this area. Right in this area, if I call the tensile force F prime, which is typically less than F, then if you divide that by A and calculate this uh, bending tensile stress, if that is bigger than that, which most of the time happens to be, then you have an increased in, uh, increase in the overall tension here. And since uh, the fiber, the material of this uh, rope has a specific strength, when a local increase in tension happens, then the maximum force that you can apply will go down. Right, because uh, you have a concent not really concentration of a stress, but you have an increase in the stress locally, and that means you cannot pull it as much as you want it to. So in general, the strength of the rope locally would go down. Okay, that is not are typically considered a decrease in the strength of the rope in a local position. Now, as you get away from the knot, you can consider again in this area to be if the mass of the rope is uh, um, negligible, you can say in these areas, the uh, tension could be constant. But that location acts like a local uh, anomaly, like, like a singularity or something. And uh, in that local area, definitely the tension is going to be different. Okay, so no knots along the rope and no significant mass of the rope. If you have these two, then in a straight rope, you can say, well, yes, if I pull it this side with F, then the tension on this other side is equal to F. And anywhere else, wherever I cut, T is also equal to what? F. So these are the two foremost conditions, but that's not all. Other things that we have to consider, the most important one is if the rope is not straight and it's going over a pulley. So the third condition is rope is not over a pulley. 
if it is then it is going to be quite different okay so let's look at a couple of things about the pulley when there is a rope around the pulley that's not necessarily means the tension on the two sides are equal because that's another thing i see my students are uh, typically neglecting is if this is a pulley here and this pulley is pinned down here in the center and here i have a, a tension like uh, T1 and on this other side I have another tension called T2 the question is is this T2 and T1 the same thing and what I see typically the student says yes they are while the answer is not necessarily okay in general they are not really equal and I can show you that there is a relation between T1 and T2 and they are not really in general equal to each other so what relation exists let's take a look so here for the moment i assume that this pulley or disc is stationary so i assume that omega is equal to what zero and alpha equals zero so this guy does not spin for the moment and uh the contact angle between the rope or the belt and the pulley is alpha. So here, this angle of contact from here to here, I can call it alpha or let's, let me call it beta if you don't mind. I would call it beta because alpha later I will use for angular acceleration as you can see here. So let me call the contact angle beta. Now, uh, the question is, here I have static friction. So here there is what? There is mu or mu s, right? And the goal is when uh, I'm trying to basically pull on the side T2, and there is this T1 tension on this side, what relation exists between T2 and T1? and whether they are equal or not for example a case of this that you might imagine is if there is this pulley and now you have what there is here this person that's on this side trying to pull and on the other side there is this big weight that you are trying to pull up so this is w and here is you standing here and trying to what? Let me use both hands. Correct. So this is you trying to pull it down. And my question is this. If this is W and this is you applying a force F to keep it in balance, do you need to apply this F equal to W to keep it in balance if there is friction here? Or no, you need a smaller force to keep it in balance. The answer is you don't need as much as W. You need smaller than W to keep it in place. Why? Because friction would come to help you. How? Let's take a look. So for this case, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to focus on a small portion of this rope, okay? So this is what you are going to do. I focus on a small portion of the rope, let's say from here to here, okay? In front of this angle, d theta. Okay, so all I will focus on will be Use a bigger thing here. This part of the rope. Okay. And uh, here, uh, let's say the radius is R. So if I focus on this portion of the rope and I write the equations of motion for that part of the rope, what do I get? By the way, here, I assume that the rope's mass or mass of the rope is what? Negligible.
So if I draw the free body diagram for that portion of the rope, what do I get? So it looks like this. And there will be two tension components acting on it. One of them would look like this. The other one would look like that. This part, I can call it uh, T. This part, I can call it T plus DT. So, uh, capital T. So here, we'll see that the tension on the two sides should not be the same. Now, uh, there are two directions that we're going to use. One of them is this direction. The other one is this direction toward the center. This is the center of the disk. This is the N direction or EN, the normal direction. And this is what? Uh, let me see if I can use one side of it. Uh, let's say if it's going like this. This is going to be ET. Okay. So uh, we are using the normal tangential uh, coordinates. If I write my equations in the uh, T direction, what do I have? Well, first I have to show my forces on it, right? What forces do I have? Is that all T and D, T plus DT, or there is something else? Well, there is something else. Why? Because the rope is in contact with what? With the pulley, so any contact comes with two forces, a normal force and a friction. So there is a normal force in this N direction, which we can call it N, right? And since this T plus DT is bigger, the rope wants to move to the right side, so friction, which is in the tangential direction, will be what? To the left. So this is going to be your friction term, F. Now your free body diagram is good, okay? There are four forces, F, N, T, and T plus D, T. By the way, what are these angles here? What is this angle? What is this angle? Well, if you look at the uh, original picture, what we have here, we connected with the line from center to the center of the uh, element of the rope. And then here, our T coordinate, our ET, is tangent to the circle. Right, so this is ET that we had, and this guy down toward the center, this one is EN. So this angle, whole thing was DT, so each one of these smaller portions, this one and this one, they are both what? D theta over 2, correct? So if you draw this ET and continue it on this side, now the question is, if you have that T and T plus DT here shown as vectors, which direction are they? Well, one of them is tangent to the rope element on this side. The other one is tangent to the rope element on the other side. So one of them is perpendicular to this line, basically. The other one is perpendicular to this one. Therefore, Based on geometry, this angle is also what? d theta over 2, and this angle is also what? d theta over 2, okay? So, based on that, if I go back, these angles are both what? d theta over 2. And now, I can write my equation in the tangential direction. In the tangential direction, what do I have? Well, in the tangential direction, if you see, I have what? I have T plus DT times cosine of D theta over 2 minus T times cosine of D theta over 2. And then minus friction force is equal to mass of that block, which you can call dm, times acceleration of that block in the t direction. And dm means what? The mass of this infinitesimal rope, which we know it should be what? 
zero because we said that the mass of the rope is what? Negligible. In the n direction, some forces in the n direction, it is going to be what? It is going to be T plus dt times sine of d theta over 2. But it is downward, so you need a what? You need a negative. The similar thing for t, that is also negative. So minus t times sine of d theta over 2. Then plus the n force, right? And that is equal to, again, the mass of the element times acceleration in the normal direction. And again, we can consider this guy to also be what? Zero. So I call them equations one and two. Now, if our goal is that we do not want the uh, rope to slip with respect to the pulley, no slipping happens, then this friction is definitely going to be what? It is going to be a static friction, right? Because we don't want it to slip. And as you know, there is no formula for uh, uh, static friction, but if we want to find the ultimate relation between uh, the T's on the two sides, in other words, if you fix one of them, what is the minimum value that you need on the other side? Like in this case, if this W is fixed, what is the minimal force F that you need to keep it in balance? For your force that you apply to be minimal, you need to use the maximum friction here that is possible. And the maximum static friction comes from what? It comes from uh, mu s times n. So you know static friction is always less than or equal mu s times n. On the verge of slipping, it is slipping. It is mu s times n. So here to find the minimal force I need, I use the equality part of it, and I say this is what? Instead of this, I say it is equal to mu s times n. So now the question is, would I get any useful relation out of these two? And the answer is yes. All I need to do is to eliminate n between equations 1 and 2. That will do the job for me because that gives me a relation between t and theta directly. Okay, so it is absolutely not hard to show that if this angle d theta right when this angle d theta is very very small because that's what we consider an infinitesimal element as you know the cosine of the angle or even in this case half of the angle is going to be approximately one and the sine of that very very small angle which is close to zero is going to be approximated by the angle itself okay so if you use these as well as those that you can see above, eliminate n, replace the, the thetas. It's absolutely not hard to sh find a relation between t and the theta directly. And if you want, we can do a, some simplification. So here, if I plug in 3 in 1, let's do it. If I plug 3 in 1, this is going to be like a 1. This is going to be like a 1. And so you're going to get T minus T, and this is just going to be DT. By the way, this is capital T, not a small t. So what you will get in the top equation is going to be DT, and you can take this term, which is mu S n to the other side. So this is going to be mu S times n. Right? And in the bottom one, if you do so, you will get negative 2t sign of that. So you will get negative t and d theta and then minus dt d theta over 2 equals negative n. Now, when the angle is very small and the tension change is very small, this term here is way smaller than this term and this term. 
because here this two have one infinitesimal term, this one has two of them. So in comparison to those two, this one can be considered as a what? As a zero, so if I neglect that, then from these equations four and five, all I need to do is to divide, correct? So all I need is four divided by five, and that will give me what? What I can also do is get rid of that negative and that negative. And that gives me dt over t d theta is equal to mu s. And if I multiply by d theta, it will be dt over t is mu s times d theta and now what I need to do is to integrate both sides this goes from t1 to t2 this goes from 0 to beta and on the left side I will have natural log of t calculated at t2 and t1 and then which is going to be, of course, natural log of uh, T2 minus T1 or natural log of T2 over T1. This is going to be equal to mu S times beta. Therefore, I can say my final equation is T2 equals T1 times exponential of mu S times beta. And this is the very famous formula that you have for a pulley along around a, uh, I'm sorry, a rope around a pulley. That the relation between the tension on the two sides is determined by E to the mu S times beta. Okay, so if I come back here and look, let's say in this case, the... Um, if I want to solve this as a numerical example, so um, let's say here, to make it a good example, let's say here the mass that you are trying to um, lift is like 50 kilogram. or not lift really, keep it in balance, just keep it in balance. This is the rope, the angle contact is here, beta equal pi, it is 180 degrees. And the question is how much is this F, right? So here, and let me give you some mu number, let's say here also mu S is equal to 0.6. So the question is, how much is F, right? The question is, how much force do you need to keep it in balance? So, um, you know, E to the mu S times uh, beta, in this case, is E to the uh, 0.6 times pi. And if you calculate that number using this lab, Exponential of 0 0.6 times pi is 6.59. So it means one of the forces is 6.59 times bigger than the other. And which one it is? It's W that is bigger because friction is helping you, right? If you let this weight go, it wants to slide down. Friction is going to be, in general, this way to keep it in balance. So it is going to come to your help. So in this case, W over F is equal that, or W is equal to F times E to the mu S times beta. Therefore, F is W divided by that number. And... Uh, W here is 50 kilogram times 9.81 divided by e to the mu s times beta. So uh, if we do that, 
The force that you need is uh, 74, 70, 48, 74, 48. So it is kind of like an eight kilogram or something, right? It is gonna be six and a half times um, lighter felt by you. So instead of you feeling like you're balancing a 50 kilogram weight, it seems like you're balancing something like an eight kilogram weight because friction is doing a ton of help to you. Okay, so please keep that in mind. If a rope goes over a pulley, even if what? Even if the mass of the rope is negligible, as we said, right? As long as there is no slipping, and even if the disc does not rotate, or in here does rotate, but the uh, inertia of the pulley is negligible, then the tension relation between the two sides is T2 equals T1 times E to the mu S times beta. And typically this number is what? Um, the only case this number is one is when mu s is zero means there is no friction which of course if there is no friction your rope is gonna slide with respect to pulleys since mu is always bigger than zero this whole thing is bigger than one so means t2 is always bigger than t1 which one is the bigger one the one that is on the side of friction is the small one the one that is trying to overcome the other force plus friction is the bigger force Okay, so uh, you see clearly T1 and T2 are not equal, right? Unless there is, as I said, no mu and that means slipping, right? Now, sometimes the rope goes over a pulley and even if you ne can neglect mu, even if you can neglect what? mu still t1 and t2 are not equal because sometimes they say probably you can you, you have seen that they say well there is this uh t1 here and there is this t2 here and they say neglect the friction on the pulley so they say what? They say neglect the friction between rope or belt and pulley and the mass of the rope. Does it mean if I neglect those, so consider mu to be zero and the mass of the pulley, the mass of the rope to be what? Also zero. If that is the case, can I say T1 is now equal to T2? Can I say such a thing? And the answer is not necessarily. Even if that both of them are the case, I still cannot say that. Why not? Well, I'll tell you why. That depends on the pulley now. What about the pulley? If this pulley, called the center of it point O, and the inertia of the pulley with respect to the center is called IO, mass moment of inertia. And this mass moment of inertia is not negligible. Right? And let's say this pulley has now motion. So alpha is what? clockwise and it is not zero it is bigger than zero and this i about oh as i said it is not equal to zero so it is a heavy pulley that you cannot neglect its moment of inertia and it does have angular what acceleration alpha now can i say t2 and t1 are equal and as i said the answer is no this goes back to your dynamics but in dynamics, summation of the moments about point O, let's say in here in a counterclockwise positive manner, it is going to be what? T2 times R minus T1 times R, where R is the radius of the pulley. So T2R is clockwise, T1 with respect to O is counterclockwise. This should be equal to I about O times alpha. 
And guess what? That means T2 minus T1 times R, correct? Is not equal to zero because IO is positive. It's a positive number and alpha clockwise is positive. So that means this whole thing is going to be what? Bigger than zero, right? And that means what? That means T2 is bigger than T1, right? Or if you want to calculate it mathematically from the top one, it means what? T2 equals T1 plus IO alpha over R. Right? So the moment of inertia of the disk times angular acceleration of the disk divided by radius of the disk, you have to add to T1 to get what? T2. So still, I cannot say the tensions are the same if the pulley's inertia cannot be neglected. Yes? You see that? So if I want to say T1 and T2 over a pulley, so let me write it down. Over a pulley tension in the rope can be considered constant if all of these conditions are valid. One mass of the rope is negligible. Two inertia of the pulley is negligible and three friction between rope and pulley is negligible you need all three of these so you can say the tension on the two sides of the pulley are what the same otherwise you cannot say so Right? So you see, I'm giving you all different scenarios and different conditions for the tension in a rope to be considered what? Constant, right? It's not just that simple. In real life, in many cases, the rope or the belt that you're using is a heavy rope. There is definitely friction between rope and the pulley. The inertia of the pulley most probably cannot be neglected. And there might even be knots. But even if there is no knots, if I want to look at this problem completely what? Completely realistically and consider everything, then not only I have to look at the effect of inertia of the pulley, and let's say I'm lifting it, I'm not just keeping it in balance, I'm really lifting it. So there is, there might be some alpha, especially in the beginning that I'm trying to lift it up. There is some alpha, so that means there should be a difference between T1 and T2 to uh, rotate the pulley, correct? So that they provide a rotation for the pulley. There should be a T1 and T2 difference because of the friction and the uh, forces that are there, this F force that you do apply here is different than the force that is here. So this T1 up here is not equal to your F and this T2 up here is different than what? Than W because these portions of the rope have mass and they cause the change in the tension. Okay, so if you really have a string gauge or something or any device to measure tension and you look at the tension here, here, and then here and here, and maybe even up there, the numbers are not going to be the same at all. Okay, now how big of a difference? It depends on all of those factors. But uh, I just want to make sure that please, please, please 
whenever you use some uh, formula or some relation or anything, make sure the assumptions behind it are valid. Thank you so much for attention, your attention. I'll see you in my next video.